get started. Uh, welcome to the uh, AE 420 preliminary aircraft design briefing. Um, kind of wanted to go over a couple things on the meeting. The course objectives here are to um, take a mission uh, RFP and system requirements and design and build and fly an airplane. And so using all of the information that the students have gathered from courses up to this point, they put it all together and uh, basically come up with an aircraft design. So today you're going to be looking at the preliminary design review for an airplane. Right. And up to this point, we've conducted a system requirements review, a conceptual design review, an interim design review, and now PDR, which culminates the paper analysis part of the design. Okay. Next semester, the students are going to be building two wind tunnel models, one for each airplane, and then testing those and evaluating performance and then making predictions on, on performance for those two wind tunnel models. Um, I say two designs because we actually have two teams. Uh, the first session here for the first hour will be Team AOLIS, and uh, they'll be presenting their design. We have a competing design from Mumtaz Aerospace who will be presenting uh, from 2.30 to 3.30. And so, uh, so we have two designs. We're going to down-select to one. The students have asked me to try and expedite that down-select so that we know before the beginning of next semester which airplane we're going to build. So uh, we have panelists here, and I want to thank you guys because we have folks from Tucson and also Phoenix here, and so I wanted to introduce our panelists. So we have uh, Major Dave Richardson, who's the detachment commander. Uh, let's see, we have Martin Martinez from ESA Corporation. Uh, it's a consulting firm down in Phoenix. We have John Smith from uh, the, he's the Navy tech rep for the SM6 missile program. We have Roger Bartlett, who's the lead systems engineer on AMRAM at Raytheon. And then we have Vernon Nickel, who's the leader of analysis for Amron down at uh, Raytheon in Tucson. So thank you guys. Really appreciate your participation here. If you have questions, what I'd like you to do is just to hold the questions until the end of the briefing so that they can all, get through all the materials. We'll have an extensive Q&A session. We'll go kind of one by one. So if you just want to write down your issues or questions as you go, uh, we'll cover those at the very end. So uh, let's see. I think I've covered everything I need. Any questions? Without any delay, let's proceed. Devin, it's all yours. Thank you, sir. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to start off by saying thank you so much for joining us here today. So, as an overview, what we'll be going over today is our team organization, our aircraft requirements, the Calibri's actual specifications, the aircraft sizing, propulsion system selection the system performance, aircraft design envelope, and the program performance. So our team organization is as follows. Hello, I am Devin Meisenschlager, the design team lead. Hi, I'm Josh Barton, system engineer. I'm Mitchell Bartlett, the airframe engineer. I'm William Matar, the propulsion engineer. I'm Sark Sedich, I'm the aerodynamics engineer. And I'm Desiree Grandma, the system performance engineer. So as you see, our team is broken up into different organizations. And under each of those, you can see that there are different people under each of those. That's because we did not all just focus on one aspect of the aircraft. We helped each other out and spread out the workload. So what are we actually doing? What we were told at the beginning of the semester was to design a UAV that could fly from El Paso to Tucson for the El Paso Gas Company. On the map, the red is the El Paso Gas Company lines which span most of the United States. And their current method of deserving these pipelines is with a Cessna 172, which is very costly, and a unmanned aircraft would be a lot more cost effective. So why is deserving these pipelines important? Well, you want to make sure that no one is tapping into the gas lines trying to take gas or any kind of terrorist activities. Another thing to be looking at is to make sure that there are no people or campers near these pipelines. The reason why, in the early 2000s, there was an incident that the pipeline actually exploded and managed to kill 12 of the campers. So we also want to avoid that kind of incident from occurring again. Next, I will be passing it off to Josh Barnes, our systems engineer. Thank you, Devin. So what I first want to go over is our project scope. So obviously for the project scope, we had to build a UAV that met the requirements given in the RFP. 
And this included selecting the material for the fuselage, wing, doing all the wing sizing, selecting what kind of airfoil we wanted to use, choosing what type of tail we were going to use. Uh, we also had to select an engine and a propeller, and we also had to select where we wanted the payload. The payload to, was given to us by the customer, so we were allowed to update it if we wanted to, but we didn't have to select what we exactly we wanted for the payload. We could make changes though if it was required. We also didn't have to design the infrastructure that we just assumed it was in place for things such as satellite uplinks or ground operators, those were assumed to already be in place from the gas company. And also any electrical wiring, none of us are electrical engineers, so we didn't have to do that. So I also want to go over the RFP requirements. On the left you can see what was given to us by the customer, and on the right are our derived requirements. Those are the requirements we felt we needed to update in order to complete our mission profile. So the first one that was updated is range. Range was increased from 300 miles to 400 miles. We felt this was necessary to increase it from 300 to 400 miles. That way we could, in case we couldn't land in a given airport, we would have to travel 100 miles to the nearest airport in order to land. We discussed this with the customer and he accepted the uh, updated requirement. We also increased the endurance from six hours to eight hours to reflect upon this uh, increase in 100 miles. Also, our maximum weight for a prelim class, we decided that it would have to be 45 pounds. The reason why we were trying to stick to a strict 45 pound limit is because in detail class, when we analyze things further, such as structure, engine placement, we wanted to make sure we have wiggle room in order to grow in case we had an estimated drag or anything like that. And also our altitude ceiling was increased from 7,000 feet to 8,500 feet. That way we can overcome a mountain range that follows the pipeline. And finally, our maximum takeoff and landing distance was decreased from 500 feet to 375 feet. We felt this was important because in case we can't land in either airport for whatever reason, we would have to land in the parking lot of the office space, which we looked at that as 400 feet. So if we allow for a 25 foot clearance, that gives us 375 feet. So here are the Calibri specifications as they stand, right, what they are predicted to stand as of right now. One thing I want to point out is our wingspan size. As you can see, it is labeled uh, 12 feet and 10 inches. So one of the RFP requirements is we have to fit in an 8-foot truck bed, and 12 feet and 10 inches will not fit in an 8-foot truck bed. So the way we're going to work around this is we're going to have modular wings that detach uh, right here and right here. So they will have to be detached and disassembled and assembled on site. The reason why we wanted to add this complexity to the design is because if we have a lot more wing, we can have, it have a higher aspect ratio, which will increase both our range and our endurance perform uh, performance. Yes. And one thing I also want to point out, our specifications, they're over what we set for our requirements. The reason why we have them so high right now is because we expect our design to mature. So if drag is overestimated or underestimated, we will still have enough uh, fuel to fit the requirements. And also, this allows us to expand our UAV to, as you saw from what Devin showed in the business case, pipelines follow all across the United States. So if we have the ability to perform uh, beyond the required 400 miles, we can expand that to flying completely different routes that have uh, a lot of requirements. So for our concept of operation, what are we going to be doing? We're going to take off from Tucson to El Paso utilizing that 375 feet of runway distance and we're going to climb to an altitude of 500 feet above ground level which gives us an operating range of 2,500 feet to 8,500 feet mean sea level. So this UAV is going to be controlled by a ground operator and this communicates via the satellite uplink that we assume to already be in place. So this UAV is going to have a camera mounted at the bottom of the fuselage that way you can observe the pipelining for the entire path. And if it detects any anomalies or irregularities, such as someone typing, tapping into the pipeline, or any campers, or any terrorist activities, it can circle around the, uh, the pipeline trying to get a better look. And if it doesn't detect any anomalies, it's just going to follow the rest of the pipelining path and land in either Tucson or El Paso. So for a mission pro... Good question. Is, um, does it have a GPS on it so that it knows where... Yes, it yes, that's all in the payload it's going to... So mission profile parameters, there are five uh, mission profiles we wanted to look at. Those are takeoff, rate of climb, cruise, descent, and landing. So the first one, the takeoff, uh, that's reflected from the requirements we gave for 375 feet. The next one is rate of climb. 
So rate of climb was determined by assuming we had to climb up to 500 feet AGL and fly directly to the nearest pipeline from our takeoff location. So we looked at both Tucson and El Paso, and we found the minimum distance from the airport to the pipeline is about three miles. So if we assume we fly to the pipeline, uh, pipeline, path, pipeline while flying up to 500 feet above ground level, flying at cruise speed, that will give us a required rate of climb of 210 feet per minute. Next thing I want to talk about is cruise. So for cruise, we have the requirement to fly 400 miles in eight hours, which gives us a required ground speed of four, uh, 50 miles per hour. So the difference between ground speed and cruise speed is the cruise speed accounts for uh, wind speed. So when we went back and looked at a 75% likelihood occurrence of wind between Tucson and El Paso, we found out that that wind speed is about 12 miles per hour. And then we, when we include gust alleviation factor, that goes up to 15 miles per hour. So in a worst case scenario, if we assume we have headwind for the entire route, we add that onto the 50 miles per hour for ground speed, and that gives us a required cruise speed of 65 miles per hour. The fourth mission profile parameter uh, descent, that was calculated in a similar fashion to the rate of climb. However, the difference in this is we assume that we're flying at 1.2 times our stall speed instead of cruise speed. And then finally, takeoff that was calculated, I mean landing that was calculated the same way takeoff was, so that's reflected as 375 uh, feet. So next, we're, gonna, we're looking at our power loading versus wind loading graph. So the vertical line shows our initial stall line, which was based on initial aircraft sizing. And the diagonal line is a power loading versus wind loading for a given wing size. So this graph shows that our uh, current design is above and to the left of, the, of both lines, which is where we want to be. So if we, we have over a 10 cent margin, so if our weight increases, which we are predicting it will increase in prelim class, that will drive it down and to the right. So we still have margin to work with for that. And finally, the last one I want to go over is power required to fly at different cruise speeds, uh, different speeds. So the horizontal line is the maximum power available, and that's based off of our engine, and it accounts for our 20 cent insulation losses. So originally our engine has a estimated maximum horsepower of 2.8, and when we account for the insulation losses, that brings it down to 2.24 horsepower. The blue line shows the power required to fly at different flight speeds, and the vertical green line shows where our current cruise speed is, is at. So while we're flying at cruise, we are not running the engine at maximum horsepower, which means we can fly faster than cruise if we need to. It also means that we are not running the engine at maximum horsepower during cruise, which is good for engine knowledge. And now I'll pass it off to Mitch, our airframe engineer. Thanks, Josh. So my name is Mitchell Bartlett, and I am the airframe engineer. I'm going to be going over the payload, the weight, and the aircraft center of gravity. So the weight. As Josh said in our specifications, our weight is 41 pounds. As you will remember from the RFP, it had to be under 55 pounds. This is due to FAA regulations stating that a small UAV under 55 pounds can be flown wherever, doesn't have to worry about airspace, and just it's a way to get around the FAA regulations. The breakdown of our weight is up there with the payload structure, uh, fuel, and the engine. But what I want to talk about in the payload is what we selected. As Josh said, the payload was given to us by the customer. However, we were allowed to change things if we found something better. The thing we found better was the CM100 UAV vision camera. It was about three pounds lighter than the camera the customer gave us and gave infrared and the ability to zoom more into the pipeline, which is the main RFP of this design, is observing that pipeline. Also, it's hard mounted, but in, it's hard mounted, sir. But in the camera itself, it, it does have a three-axis gimbal okay. to it, so it can see a gimbal. Also, um, of concern in the payload is the payload temperature, or the temperatures that the payload will have to go through in that zero to 120 degree hot day condition. And as of right now, all of our payload components are still worse at that low end and at that high end. Slide. Please. So, to get an initial weight estimate of the Colibri, we looked at two very similar aircrafts, the Boeing Scan Eagle and the Exist Dude Penguin B. As you can see, our structure is right under the Penguin B at that 44 pounds. The Scan Eagle, or 44%, excuse me. The Scan Eagle has a structure weight of approximately 62% of its total weight. 
We believe our structure weight is going to be more towards the scan eagle as we do more detailed analysis of the structure next semester. That's why we are basing our weight so low right now. The aircraft center of gravity is located about 30, it's located 33 inches back from the nose. You will notice on this diagram, the nose gear and the main gear are in front of and behind, respectively, of the center of gravity. This way we are on the runway, we're not moving. Our aircraft rests comfortably on the ground. We do not have a nose tipping down or a tail tipping down moment, and we do not drag our air, well, aircraft across the ground. Also, our aircraft will be mostly made out of carbon fiber. The boom poles that you can see on the far right, the second to last tag, those will be made out of aluminum for structural strength, but as far as the fuselage and the inverted tail and the wing go, it will be an insulation foam that we'll use to add to structure and then a carbon fiber outer layer that goes over that foam. Also of note on the aircraft center of gravity picture is we have two axis hatches. In order to get the maximum space for our payload, we want to use both sides of our fuselage. So we have, we have a floor going approximately 42 inches back from that nose data. We wanted to put payload components both on the top and bottom of that floor. You'll notice the camera and the GPS unit, I apologize, I should say five inches, not five feet, but uh, the camera is mounted on the bottom. It does have that gimbal, like you said, sir, so it can see the pipeline. The GPS unit is on top of the floor, so it does can communicate with the global positioning satellite. The telemetry unit and the radar altimeter are both directed towards the bottom, so it can connect to that telemetry flat ground unit, and the radar altimeter can give us our altitude. Also of note, if you go back a slide, our center of gravity is at 33 inches. Our fuel tank is at 33 inches. This is not a coincidence. We did this on purpose. As we're using that fuel, we're going to be going down from 9 pounds to 5 pounds to 1 pound. We don't want our aircraft center of gravity to change. We don't want our static margin to change. So what we did to get around this was just for a fuel tank directly on that center of gravity. So as we use that fuel, our center of gravity does not change. You'll also notice on this picture, there are no mounts for the engine to that bulkhead right in front of it. This is because we've not done that detailed structural analysis that we will do next semester in detail. And that's, how we're, that's one example of how we're going to add weight to our airplane so it will not be that 41 pounds. And next I'd like to uh, bring up Sora Pasevich, our aerodynamics engineer. All right, thank you, Mitch. Okay, so some things we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about wing area, I'm going to talk about steel max, I'm going to talk about dragging the aircraft. So there should be four things I'm going to talk about for the wing area. The first thing I'm going to talk about is going to be looking at our vortex drag versus our aspect ratio. So obviously we need a high range of endurance for this aircraft, so we need to minimize as much drag as possible for this aircraft. And one way we're going to probably do this is by reducing the vortex drag and trying to minimize the skin friction drag as well too. But with the vortex drag, if we have a higher aspect ratio from the trend line shown, is that if we have a higher aspect ratio, we're going to get a lower vortex drag generated from our airfoil wing section. The next thing we're going to look at is our CL alpha, which is our lift curve slope of the airfoil section of a 3D wing versus the, the, yeah, versus the aspect ratio. When we have a higher aspect ratio, we're going to get a lower drop in the CL alpha of our wing when we go from a 2D to a 3D. The reason why we want to make sure that we're not losing too much of a loss in our lift curve slope is because we want to keep our high CL axis and also want to keep the same stall region as our 2D airfoil when we go to a 3D airfoil section. So we need a high aspect ratio to make sure we're not losing our CL alpha of our airfoil section when we go from a 2D to a 3D. The third thing we're going to look at is the sweep of a wing of the aircraft. So the sweep is going to reduce the onset of wave drag. The only thing is that the mop of our aircraft is only 0.08. We're not even at the 0.3 regime, which is the incompressible regime, so we're not going to even worry about wave drag. And if we do add sweep to our aircraft and we need to move the, the aerodynamic center, the only thing is it's going to reduce the lifting produce, production of our wing itself. So the wing is only going to produce the uh, oncoming free stream perpendicular to that airfoil. So that means if we're going to produce the same amount of lift, we're going to need a longer wing, which means more manufacturing. Uh, tolerances to it, it needs more materials, more expenses. The final thing we're going to look at is dihedral of our aircraft. So dihedral is going to give roll stability to the aircraft, but the thing with dihedral is we're going to lose lift production of the wing when we add dihedral. 
So, in order to overcome the roll stability of the aircraft, we're actually going to mount it as a high mounted wing, which is going to add roll stability to the aircraft anyways, without having to add dihedrals to the aircraft. So we can have a smaller wing, less manufacturing <coughs> difficulty to it, less materials, and less cost to the aircraft. So this is going to give us a wing area, of a, it's going to give us a wingspan effective of 11 feet. That's what's actually going to be producing the lift of the aircraft. It's going to be 11 feet. It's different from the 12 feet and 10 inches. Those wingtip to wingtip with the winglets, the actual effective wing is actually 11 feet. Our cord is only going to be one foot, so that's going to give us a surface area and a platform area of 11 feet squared and also an aspect ratio of 11. And like I discussed before, we're not going to add dihedral or sweep to our aircraft to minimize this. Why did you choose your winglet size? The winglet size, I had to optimize it using X Flyer 5. I had to simulate it in a CFD component. Over summer, I'm going to then produce uh, rapid prototype models of different um, configurations of the winglet and then actually wind tunnel test it to make sure I'm optimizing my winglets for my aircraft. So then if we look at our CL versus of our wing, we wanted our wing to be the main lifting component of our aircraft. So we're going to look at airfoils. So I looked at 39 different airfoils to configure all of them, pile them together to figure out which airfoil I want to use that's going to be the best for our aircraft. So I came out with the Dayton Wright T1 airfoil. It's going to give us a great lift and a low drag from all the airfoils that combine. And then our CL Alpha is zero, which is estimated <coughs> using X Flyer 5. The 2D plot shown up here is actually simulated from X Foil, and then the 3D plot is actually simulated from X Flyer 5, which are uh, computationals. I couldn't find wind tunnel data on the Dayton Wright T1 airfoil, so I had to computationally come up with the plots for the lift curve slope of the airfoil itself. So that CL alpha is going to be estimated from x 5 for a 3D wing is going to be 0.637, but we're going to go with 0.6 since we can't be that confident in our estimations of the computational until we go into detail in the wind tunnel model to actually underestimate uh, what the CL will be at alpha zero. And we want to do an alpha zero is because we don't want to put an instant angle of the wings that's going to complicate manufacturing of the aircraft itself. And we're going to get a CL max of 1.4. The reason that we can't actually get up to the max with the 3D component is that XFlyer 5 can't converge onto a solution for a 3D solution. But since our lift curve slopes are so similar from the 2D to the 3D effect, that we can assume that our lift curve max will be actually a 1.4, which is the 2D. But even though we're actually, this is just for a wing with XFlyer 5 and can't incorporate the body losses, we're not expecting it to be totally max of 1.4 when we actually hit the wind tunnel model itself. And then our rain loss is going to be 457,500 for that aircraft, which is the density at the altitude of 6,300 feet, which is their 10% hot day condition. So then we're going to look at our CL versus CM. When we go from a 2D to 3D, this linear line is actually what is to be expected when we go from a 2D to a 3D effect of our wing. So this is nothing to worry about. So our CM is actually within the range that we needed for uh, stability control. It's going to be negative, so that means when we're going to pitch up, we're going to get higher CL values, pretty negative coefficient of moment, so we're just going to pitch down. So it's going to be a, a, st a stable aircraft. But it's also going to be in the range that it's not going to be too stable that we're going to have to fight it. And then if we're going to look at the winglet analysis, like I said before, I had to do it computationally because I've read some reports. In all the reports, there's no equations or anything kind of how to estimate the winglet design. You have to do it computationally and figure out what the optimal is. So I use X Flyer 5 to help me optimize my winglet design. So to optimize my winglet design, instead of adding taper ratio to the aircraft to actually get an elliptical lift-wise distribution, I use winglets to accomplish the same thing with a smaller wing and without taper ratio. Because we don't want to have taper ratio because the Reynolds numbers are already really low. And we don't have to worry about getting smaller cords which means lower Reynolds number for our aircraft itself. Yeah. So I'm not really ever an answer, so I asked this question. So the CM on the previous chart, how do you know it's not so stable that you're going to have trouble making it? Because when you go into civilian control, it t there's a regime for aircraft of this size that says CM should be within this range to this range. Thing you put on the That's right. I, it's going to be later on in the um, civilian control section. Okay. okay, so with the winglet, so like I said, I didn't want to have the taper ratio because I wanted to have a smaller wing, which means the manufacturing would be less difficult. 
So our max LRD, I actually increased our max LRD of our aircraft with winglets to 10%. So that means we're actually going to get a better range of endurance out of our aircraft. So the thing is too is also you can optimize winglets so that you can get your max LRD roughly to your cruise conditions. So we, with our cruise condition, it's really close to our max LRD, which means we're going to be flying at minimum thrust, which means we're going to get a maximum range out of our aircraft, so you're going to get the most efficiency out of your aircraft that you can see. But with wingless, there is a drag crossover effect. There's a point when it actually doesn't reduce drag, it actually adds drag to the aircraft. But from the plot shown, that we can see that the speed at which the two points should actually cross is past the speed of our aircraft, which means we're actually going to get a reduction in drag for all regimes of our flight of our aircraft. And then I use the PS90, PSU90 125WL. This is a very common airfoil for configurations of winglets. But like I said before, I will go into summer and actually do more research on configurations of the winglets so we can actually get a true optimal effect instead of a computational optimal. So then we go into the tail analysis. We went with an inverted detail configuration. The reason why I want to go with the inverted detail configuration is because we want to minimize the skin the surface area of both the horizontal and the vertical tail. So with an inverted V tail, we're going to have a Reynolds number of the 381,000 range. So it's going to be still pretty close to where our wing is. We went with the NACA 0012. The reason why I went with the NACA 0012 is because we're having our main wing actually produce the whole lift for the aircraft. We want to use the tail as just a control and stability surface. So we went with NACA 0012 because it's going to minimize drag of the aircraft for the tail section. From the plot up here, you're going to see that there's a huge drop in the lift curve slope from a 2D to a 3D effect. The reason is that is because of the configuration of the inverted detail. Like I said, we have add dihedral, it's the same thing as the inverted detail. We're going to lose a lot of lift producing, so that means our lift curve slope is going to drop a lot. I also showed wind tunnel data versus the computational data from XFOIL to kind of come comfort you in the fact that our actual estimations are pretty close. It's still an estimation, it's not an exact number. Our exact numbers will actually come from detail when we actually do wind tunnel analysis, but it's a good estimation for right now of our aircraft. And then we're going to have our CM versus CL plot. So before, when we were actually going to pitch down, we're going to get negative CL, we're going to pitch back up, grab positive CM, and then I'm sure you're worried about this curve right here. This curve right here, from what I can can put together is that because the inverted detail configuration is we're going to have high separation and huge boundary layer buildup at the point of the tip of the tail where those two airfoil sections meet. I can't fully confirm it until detail analysis, until we do actual wind tunnel analysis to confirm that this is what that lift curve slope is actually doing. But for right now, I'm pretty confident it's the separation at the tip of the, of the vertical tail. And then we're going to look at our drag of our aircraft. So obviously we're not flying at the minimum drag for our wing section, but because of the wing lens, we can optimize the vortex drag to be as minimal as possible, so we can actually minimize the drag as much as possible. Even though we're not at the minimum drag, we're really close, which is that CL of 0.6, like I said before, for our aircraft. And it's gonna be really close to that CD minimum, so we're gonna actually have a minimum drag coming out of our wing. And then if we look at our tail section, we actually are going to get the minimum drag out of our tail section because of the NACA 0012, because we're not producing any lift, so it should be skin for just to minimize as much drag as possible of this aircraft. And the thing is, too, is that actually with our body, so I'm a little worried that we're actually getting flow separation from that nose of that aircraft, so I'm going to analyze maybe vortex generators at the top of the fuselage to actually have flow attached longer to the fuselage body, so that when we hit the wing, we're not going to have a lot of losses in lift of our airfoil section. And then I only, I only went over the drag components computationally for the wing and the tail section. I used Roscoe and Delta methods to have a drag buildup method of the whole entire aircraft. Both methods are actually empirical methods. They use plots of empirical data from past aircraft to come up with the total drag of the aircraft. Rossin method breaks it down to components of the wing, tail, skew saw section, camera's gear, and so on and so forth. And then the delta method actually breaks down into the different types of drag, which is parasitic drag, vortex drag, and any kind of differentiations in those drags themselves. So from the Rossin's method, the CD is 0 0.1294. It's an overestimation because for the drag of the gear and camera, they don't give you an exact estimation of what those drags will be. So I chose the worst case scenario from the drag components of those things. So it's an overestimation for drag. 
And then with the CD of 0.1192 from the delta method is an underestimation because it doesn't incorporate the gear or the camera of the aircraft, so it's an underestimation. So since we can't have level of competencies of this greatness, I'm going with the 0.12 CD for the total aircraft, which I'm very confident in because it lies between the two, which is overestimation and underestimation. That's a good estimation for our aircraft design. And it's really close to the pavement B, which is the CD of 0.1, which we're seeing as a, a trend here is that we're really close to designs that have already been tested and are outside in the field. And that concludes my presentation, and I'm going to hand it off to Walden Mantar, our poster engineer. So uh, we started by uh, have, uh, doing a case study between gasoline engines and electric motors to see which propulsion system fits our UAV better. We concluded that we can't use an, uh, an electric motor because uh, for the required endurance we're going to be needing 240 pounds of battery. And uh, also the battery's lifetime is, uh, is, <clears throat> is affected by a lot of components. And every time we're going to have to change the battery, we're going to be needing approximately $16,000. So we looked at a couple of gasoline engines, and we chose uh, we chose an engine provided from uh, Power for Flight Company. It is a two-stroke uh, two single-cylinder engine. It, it weighs five pounds. It, it produces 2.24 horsepower, in, including the 20% installation loss and uh, brake specific fuel consumption of 3.94 times 10 to the negative seven, and an engine loading of 0.051. And also the engine maintenance, uh, the engine will be needing to be sent back to the company for maintenance after a certain uh, amount of hours or mileage, unless there's a, a serious issue like uh, a structural fatigue or uh, lack of performance. Uh, then we did another case study compare, uh, compare between fixed pitch propellers and constant speed propellers. We chose a fixed pitch propeller because they produce higher thrust, higher maximum RPM, and uh, they cost and weight less. So the propeller that we chose is 20 inches in diameter and 14 inches in pitch. And um, in the figure above, uh, that we calculated our advance ratio to be um, approximately 0.7. The advance ratio is basically this, the ratio of the speed of the free stream to the speed of the propeller. So, uh, and we, we achieved uh, uh, a propeller efficiency of 0 0.85. And basically the advance ratio, the higher it is, the better it is for cruise flight. And this, uh, this graph was evaluated at 5,000 RPM, which is our cruise RPM. And then after choosing our engine and, and propeller, we calculated our <coughs> average Takeoff threat, takeoff speed to be 40 feet per second with 8,000 RPM to produce 14.5 pounds of thrust, and our average cruise speed to be 96 feet, feet per second with 5,000 RPM to produce 9 pounds of thrust, which equals our uh, our drag as well. And lastly, for landing, we calculated the speed to be 41 feet per second without RPM and uh, no. In no thrust produced. And uh, now I'll, I'll hand it off to Desiree, our <coughs> engine system performance engineer. Thank you, Ali. So to begin with range, the brigade range equations were used in order to make an estimation for what we think the calibre is going to be performing at. If you'll notice, the blue dot in the top right hand corner indicates that we're looking at about a 675 mile range for the calibre. If you follow that trend line all the way down to the bottom left, you'll notice that it ends still above the minimum <coughs> range requirement green line indicated at 400 miles. This tells us that even if we are, are assuming propeller efficiency of 0.85, if it's not as efficient as we think it's going to be, we'll still be able to accomplish the mission. And then the bottom right red square on the graph shows the minimum amount of fuel required to meet the 400 mile uh, team developed requirement. So that's using 5.1 pounds of fuel versus the maximum capacity of 9 pounds of fuel. So for endurance, again, the brigade range equations were used to calculate this. The blue dot in the top right shows that at 9 pounds of fuel and an assumed propeller efficiency of 0.85, we're looking at just over 14 and a half hours. And then again, that same, the trend line ends at the bottom left. It's still above the minimum green line of 8 hours. 
The red square on the bottom right also is using that 5.1 pounds, which is the minimum amount of fuel to meet the required range. So using that for an endurance, we're still able to meet the endurance requirements for the mission. <coughs> the takeoff and landing distances were calculated at both cities, El Paso and Tucson. There's about a thousand foot elevation difference between the two cities. However, you'll notice that there's not much of a difference between the two points, uh, between both cities respect respectively for the calculations. So taking the average of the two, our takeoff distance is about 172 feet, and our landing distance is coming out to be about 232 feet. As Josh explained earlier, we are going for a requirement of no more than a 375 foot takeoff or landing speed. So these are really good numbers because what it means is that not only can we make an emergency landing in the facilities themselves, but if we have to make the emergency landing out in the field somewhere while observing the pipeline, we'll potentially be able to find a spot in order to do so. So in summary, all of the Calibri system performance requirements meet or, far, or far, go above or far exceed what both the original RFP requirements were and the team's derived requirements. So from a system performance standpoint, it's a really good design for our projected estimations currently. So the CATIA uh, model was rendered. Looking at a top view, you'll notice that as Josh ind indicated before, it's from winglet tip to winglet tip. We're looking at about a 12 foot, 10 inch wingspan. The control surfaces were sized based off of Raymer's method. So this yielded the ailerons of three feet by three inches. That's for your roll control. Your rudder baiters combine the uh, elevators and rudder to be, their dimensions are 20 inches by four inches. And this is gonna be your yawn pitch control. The table in the top right, shows what Raymer's suggested ranges are for side under control surfaces and then what the actual percentages are. So all of our all of our actual dimensions for the control surfaces fall within Raymer's method. Looking at a front view of the aircraft, you'll notice that the angle that the tail makes with itself is 90 degrees, which means that with the horizontal it's going to be a 45 degree angle. That angle is also reflected in the bottom between the ground and the main gear. It's another 45 degree angle. And the complete height of the calibri from the ground up to the top of the V-tail is 3 feet 4 inches. So the complete length of it going from the nose all the way to the back of the V-tail is just over 7 feet, which means that we will be able to fit in that 8 foot truck bed, providing that the modular wings are detached. Another important angle to note is the angle that you make between the wheel and the ground all the way to the bottom point where, from where the propeller is rotating. This needs to be at least 15 degrees in order to successfully take off. So it, our projected angle is 25 degrees. This is above 15 degrees. So this means that the Calibri will be able to successfully take off without damaging the propeller. The isometric view you'll notice is with all materials completely rendered. The dark coloring, as Bartlett went over before, indicates the carbon fiber outer shell. The propeller is made out of fiberglass, and the boom poles are made out of aluminum. So now that we have the design, we need to know if it's stable. Can the aircraft actually fly properly? So first we did a static stability analysis. The top table indica excuse me, indicates the longitudinal stability parameters and the bottom table indicates the lateral directional stability parameters. All of these parameters need to be within the accepted range in order for the aircraft design to be considered statically stable. However, one of the more important ones to note is the static margin. In order for this to be considered stable for a low speed UAV, the static margin needs to be between 0.15 and 0.25. Based off of our estimations, we're indicating that the Calibri will produce a static margin of 0.2. So this falls right in between the indicated ranges. So it's a really good static margin. The way this is calculated is you take your aircraft aerodynamic center and you subtract it from your aircraft center of gravity. In order for this to be considered positive, to be considered stable, the aircraft aerodynamic center has to be more aft than the aircraft center of gravity. The point two is positive, therefore it does meet those requirements. And now I'll be calling on Walid to go over the dynamic stability analysis. So for our dynamic stability, we wrote a MATLAB code that uses equations derived from the equation of motion uh, for each uh, for each for each mode, and um, and also the tra uh, Laplace transformation to get our poles. From the poles, we can calculate the natural frequency, uh, from which we can know what what mode are we evaluating, 
after that, we can get the damping ratio and the time constant. From the time constant, we can know if our, if our UAV is stable or not. So we, um, and we are stable in, in all literal directional and longitudinal modes except spiral. But since it's, uh, le le uh, the time constant is less than negative 12, then the color is still considered uh, controllable, but will be needing to be trimmed every 27 seconds. So in conclusion, the, the color is statically and dynamically uh, uh, stable and will be able uh, and will be controllable during flight. And uh, now I'll hand it off to Devin. Right. Question, huh? So um, Dutch, roll. The Dutch roll is basically a combination between um, roll and yaw, mm -hmm. and um, this, this spiral is like the spinning of the aircraft that's in the literal direction mode. But for the longitudinal mode, the short period and the short period is uh, is basically the. Is the, the short is the movement of the, the the short period is the movement of the aircraft, and the fugoid is is also the uh, considered of the the longer period. And uh, now I need up Devin. All right, thank you, Wally. So we just went over a lot of information. So how much is this actually going to cost? Well, we put together a study between the yearly cost of the Calibri and the cost of the Cessna 172, which would include the operator and maintenance fees, hangar fees, all of that put together. So, a yearly cost of the Calibri would be a little bit above $4,000, whereas the Cessna 172, the yearly cost is about $15,000. That's a lot more money. So what else we need to look at is the actual fits cost of both of these aircrafts. So for the Calibri, if you buy one unit, it is a little under uh, $20,000, excuse me. Whereas you can't even buy a used Cessna for that much, which is about $80,000. That's four times greater than one unit of the Calibri. Now the big hitter here is the fits cost of the beginning, which is the design cost. And since this is a new design that we are starting from scratch, we had to have a design cost for the prototype for everything put together. So the overall cost would be $222,000. But if you look at the cost of the uh, unit itself and the yearly cost put together, it's going to mitigate itself over the next few years after you buy so many units. So what else we need to look at is what we're actually going to be doing next semester. So on the right side is the prototype cost, and on the left side is the actual production cost of the aircraft. Next semester we will be building the prototype, and it's only a little bit above $1,000. As you can see, there are some components missing in the prototype. That is because we do not need the GPS unit or the camera, because we are going to be flying it manually instead of with a computer. And so with those costs, we can see that the Calibri is a little bit, is less expensive than the Scan Eagle, but a little bit more expensive than the Pigment B. Now that being said, that's for only buying one unit. If you buy multiple units, that cost is going to go down because that's including production costs and all that. So the cost will be mitigated if more units are bought. So this is the cost analysis that we did from the beginning of this semester. The blue, the excuse me, the red line is the projected cost that we came up with at the beginning of the semester, and the blue is the actual cost that we put together with all our hours worked and time put into this project. The cost that we actually came up with is cheaper than the projected cost at the beginning of the semester. That's a good thing because next semester we are actually going to be building this program and so there are unforeseen problems that could arise but we have that a lot of money to go towards any issues that arise so we have that buffer there. Next is the detail design process that's being broken up. What we broke it down into is the different uh, parts of the aircraft that are going to be built. We put together how many 
man hours that's going to be and how much wait time, which gives us the total cost that we're going to be looking at per detail. This isn't a finalized cost, there's more analysis to go into as the net semester arises. So, all that money, is it worth it? Here is our schedule that we had at the beginning of the semester. It is very small, so I broke it down for you. Here is what we did for the beginning part of the semester. We had three different reports, the reports that were turned in, and within these reports, we had six different modifications through this aircraft. So we were trying to make sure that we changed the aircraft to make sure the customer was getting the best aircraft it could. Next slide. The second part of the semester, we had two more design modifications, which included adding the winglet to this aircraft. And I want to note that we met all our deadlines for everything, except for the wind tunnel model. That is because we had our model complete and sent into the rapid prototype lab. However, the rotoprof rapid prototype lab was behind schedule, so the prototype was actually not able to be printed, but that's okay because we're not actually testing the model until next semester. Have we looked at the risk of this program for next semester? Yes, we have. So, the, as you can see, there's no risk in the high risk uh, area, which is the red on the graph, but there are some in the green and yellow, which is low to moderate risk. That's okay because we have plans to go through all of those to make sure that if those risks arise, we can mitigate them and work through them as a team. So that was a lot of information. Here's a summary slide of all the numbers that we gave you. As you can see, our aircraft right now is predicted to meet all the requirements for next semester. No, it's a prediction. We cannot be certain of these numbers since we haven't actually built the aircraft. So, this is all the different information we went over. This concludes our presentation. Are there any questions?
first thing is the cost right. and also the horsepower. This is two point oh. This is two point eight horsepower. The other one is five uh, okay. five horsepower. So that's almost five horsepower it's cheaper. Why is the lower horsepower engine more expensive? Because this uh, brake specific fuel consumption is, is is not as good as the expensive engine. Almost there. If I could have, if I could have, if I could have, um, the uh, the engine that we're actually using in the prototype is not fuel injected, so therefore um, this engine is a lot cheaper than the fuel injected engine that we do have in our designed aircraft. The Volkswagen on Lamborghini. Yes, sir. <laughs> very much. Uh, actually, I did that um, for my aero 
Thermodynamics, um, I actually made it so that if we were the 55 pounds, we still would meet all the requirements for range endurance and lifting with components. So if we do get heavier, the aerodynamics will be able to hold up the aircraft part of it, and the propulsion is made sure that we have enough power to actually push that weight. So we made, we went with worst case scenario, the 55 pounds, and then try to reduce the weight as much as possible because we know it's going to grow, because that's how it always happens in product planning. It's, it's just going to get bigger, so we want to make sure that we kind of spearhead that one issue. So you still meet your range requirements? So yes, we will meet our range and endurance requirements from the aerodynamics and proportions, even if it does get heavier, and it still is under 55 pounds. What are your thoughts on that? If you're saying on cruise speed, you guys are saying ground would be 50, but then you guys are going to 65, and then you said something about like 15 miles an hour or something like that. The 75% likelihood of wind currents? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on Mark mentioned that? Well, like, you guys actually said, okay, the max you've ever seen is 12, so it's 15, and then we're there. We uh, looked at the, there's a website, I can't remember what it was called off the top of my head, but it listed all the wind speeds uh -huh. from Tucson and El Paso, and then a uh, city in between, do you remember what it's called? I do not. We, oh, we just, I do remember the website that we use, the na National Atmosphere. Um, NOAA. NOA, yeah, 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 NOA. Yeah. So, continue your phone, yeah. So, we looked at that, and the average we thought was about 10. Mm -hmm. The maximum we saw was close to 16. Mm -hmm. So, we just took about 75% of that, and it came out to be about 12 feet per second. The, it pretty much almost never went over 12 feet per second. It only went over in like two days. So we feel pretty confident in saying 12 feet per second is a good, uh, solid, uh, almost worst case scenario. 16 would be the worst case, but we weren't asked to design to a worst case scenario for a wind yeah. occurrence. We were asked to design to 75% of wind occurrence from our feet. Let me ask for clarification. You mentioned wind speed 12 feet per second. Yeah, uh, 12 miles per hour, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sure. Okay. What next near the beginning the primary premise is right the premise is that you consider, I know you mentioned a little bit about you don't have to maintain this design very much, especially the engine. Have you consider durability and how long the lifespan of this has to be, if you give any guidance from the customer? Because I'm wondering if you have this modular wing, right? How many times can you take that apart and back together before it, like? We weren't given a time, a lifespan. Okay. Well, that, that'll be that'll be analyzed in detail when we go to the structure yeah, part. See, I think you kind of want to consider even maybe, sometimes what happens in the real world is your customer doesn't take about a certain requirement, and you, you guys have. You're, you're actually, a lot of times, you're smarter than your customer. You are. Because yeah. you know you know your design, and you have to go back to the customer and say, hey, you guys didn't have a requirement here for like durability at this point, so I think we need to open them and go, oh, yeah, good idea. So something you might want to think about is, like, how durable is this going to be? Does that have to last three years? Yeah. So can I switch it out every year? Is it going to last, like, three times? How many times can be shot? You know? Yeah. That's kind of your right requirement sometimes when you get the customer. You need to teach your customer what they need to care about sometimes. With the with the wing modular section? Yeah, with the wing modular section, I'm actually I'm trying I'm working on actually looking at flutter analysis of the wing, which actually will give me a lifespan of that modular wing so we can actually incorporate how long the lifespan of the aircraft was. Okay. So we're we're gonna try to do more lifespan stuff, but that's gonna be great detail when we get to the And it doesn't hurt to put that stuff up in the drive yeah, right now. Too. Yeah, yeah, we thought about that. this, we thought about this. Thermal considerations that because of the heat stroke engine you got up front, I guess I don't remember. Yeah, with all the instruments in that, was, yeah, is there any real consideration or worry? It's in the back. Yeah. But as so far as you know, ventilation, airflow, yeah, what special considerations are there the for the engine? We have not done any of the analysis of how hot the engine is going to get yet. That's going to be next semester when we actually get the engine, um, test the engine, figure out if that's the engine we're going to use, and then get the thermal specs from that, and then start looking at access holes to the engine to allow air flow into there to cool off the engine. Yeah, that's kind of what you just assume is a thermal mess. That's going to be easy, dude. Yes, sir. Uh, along those lines, like, how did you have that one up there? You know, you're not showing how you're uh, mounting. I, I did speak on that in our presentation, sir. And my only concern is to make it in a certain spot. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, how much more can you have? It's not going to be that big of a deal, but you know, I'm looking at it, you're supposed to do it. It's going to be a two rear wheel, so, right? Yes, sir. That's just, that could be a risk. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, while we have the slide up here, a question I have is uh, you got it. Right
try to smack on the CP. But when you deplete fuel, that fuel level is going to drop down and it will not stay light. It will slosh. It's going to go out and it's going to go forward. And you're going to have some serious pitch up or pitch down depending on where that fuel wants to go and it's not going to stay level. So have you thought about what happens when the fuel sloshes forward or after? So the reason we selected nine pounds of fuel, sir, instead of you saw how those minimum values we give was five pounds. So that gives us four pounds that we can get rid of. And the way we're thinking about it is our fuel tank is basically one big square with the fuel coming out from the bottom and going in the engine. What we're going to do is add wedges. It'll force the fuel down. So that way, no matter if you're pitched up or pitched down, the fuel will always be wedged down onto that hole, which will access to the engine. Is that kind of like a design Kind of yes, sir, I believe. I okay. do not know what a map design is, but... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. back, back in the old days, when people like the water beds, yeah. right, you have baffles in the water bed to keep the thing from sloshing. Just think of it as meshes that are vertical. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So, yes, sir. That's basically what we're going to put things inside the fuel tank in order to force the fuel down. Yeah, I was thinking Yes, sir. They're solid wedges right now. But they, you know, that's just going to have a problem with the slides. Yeah. So I've got to tell you, I've acted as both the instructor and the customer in this. So, yeah, so it will be fine. Well, back to the customer. Go back to that cost sheet. I don't think you guys have that in the cost sheet. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, that was going to be So in regards to 
regards to how much you need to deflect the control surfaces in order to make certain turns or whatnot, that analysis is going to be done in great detail.